So, uh, good morning still. We start the first oral session on uh, seismic source, on, uh, sources and uh, theory and practice, seismoacoustic sources. Uh, this session will have uh, two parts. Uh, the first part will be uh, based, focusing on seismic sources, and then we will have a lunch break, and then two uh, presentations on infrasound sources. Uh, so this session here has three presentations and will be chaired by my colleague, Atalai. Uh, so please, Atalai, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Paulina. So uh, I'm co-chairing this session. Uh, uh, I'm from Addis Ababa University. My name is Atalia Ayel. Uh, so I, I will have three uh, talks to, to chair. So I, I would be very happy if uh, the presenters can finish uh, a couple of minutes earlier, like to something minutes, so that we'll have a little bit of discussion or comment. So that, I would appreciate that. So the first presenter will be uh, uh, Robert, actually, uh, yeah. So uh, it is the Rock Valley direct comparison experiment. It's an overview present presentation or talk. So this is a, this is the slide. Okay. Yeah, this one is next, next, and this one is previous. Yeah. Thank you. So I might as well get started. I'm Rob Abbott, um, so I can take a little time before the first slide shows. Um, I'd like to, co I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge my co-authors, Kathy Snelson and Bill Walter, who couldn't be here today, and uh, Cleet Zeiler, who was in the audience. And I'm going to be talking about uh, something that like, Administrator Ruby mentioned in the, uh, in the opening session, that one of the things that, in, uh, that uh, the United States does to advance nuclear nonproliferation is to do large-scale experiments at the Nevada National Security Site. And that's gonna be the focus of my, my talk here. There's an overview um, that I'm gonna give. And there's also a poster, a poster in the poster sessions that I'll also be giving that's based on the, uh, in, uh, the instrumentation plan for this, for this experiment. So to, to, to make good use of the time, uh, since we don't know you much, it's good to the presenters to introduce yourself. There's no, nothing given to us, so <laughs> some people. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm Rob Abbott, like I said. I'm at Sandia National Laboratories in the United States, Albuquerque, New Mexico. My co-authors are at other national labs and uh, the Nevada National Security Site in, in also United States, so Lawrence Livermore Labs and Los Alamos National Lab, as well as the Nevada National Security Site. We apologize for the technical hiccup. I hope we'll catch up. Thank you. So you, you, you're from the 
Santa Lamos. Santa Lamos. Uh, Zandia. Zandia de Lomas. Which is in Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Los Alamos National Land is also in New Mexico. They're in Los, Los Alamos, New Mexico. So <laughs> it's one of three. It's the biggest city in, in New Mexico, so that's where the airport is. And everything. So Los Alamos is to the north, and Albuquerque is kind of central. All right, it looks like we're good to go here. Um, the title of my talk is The Rock Valley Direct Comparison Experiment, an overview and my co-authors I've mentioned before. So what I'll talk about is an outline. Um, we're gonna talk about the motivation of what we're, what we're trying to accomplish with the project. Uh, the Rock Valley Direct Comparison Experiment is the third phase of the source physics experiments, and I'm gonna go in a little bit of background of those. And then I'm gonna move on to talking about the 1993 Rock Valley shallow earthquakes that happened on the Nevada National Security Site, which is the, the motivating factor for having this experiment, that it's a, it's a nice coincidence that we have this a uh, series of shallow earthquakes that we can exploit, and then I'm going to get into the experiment um, itself. So what we want to answer is what are the distinct characteristics of explosion uh, seismoacoustically that enable us to identify them in the background of other events? And um, as you can see here, we have three types of seismic sources, and it's well known that these have different source mechanisms, radiation patterns, different um, preponderance of P waves versus shear waves, for instance, depending on what the, depending on what the, the source is. But what we, what we want to really get at is, you know, what is that confounding factor that makes these signals be more complex than maybe they ordinarily you'd think it would be? And that is signal differences due to the source depth and also the source material properties, which is kind of a more difficult thing to, uh, ex uh, to exercise experimentally, at least uh, until, until now. So one workhorse discriminant is the, is the uh, surface magnitude, magnitude body wave magnitudes. Um, it's a long-standing discriminant, but it also has issues as well. It works, in a, it works well in a lot of situations, where on the left-hand side there, you see that we have an explosion which has in the P wave window a large amount of energy, where the uh, earthquake has less, and vice versa in the, in the Rayleigh wave energy as well. But We've, as we've seen, it did not work very well for the North Korean test for some reason. And as well, you know, you have this like confounding effect of having simultaneous tectonic release and how is that handled? And it's, you know, and again, it's hard to measure MS for, for very small events, which, which we're moving towards. But there are also unexplained phenomena like the reversed Rayleigh waves that you see in some shots on the Nevada test site, hard hat there, for instance, from a, a classic Brune and Pomeroy paper that is unexplained, and it's probably due to some sort of source material or, or, short, or, or depth, uh, of depth of burial of the explosion. And on the right-hand side, we see there from a, a, a figure from Selby that the DPRK events did not discriminate very well, did not separate very well, at least with this discriminant, um, from, from earthquakes. And we want to you know, get at why that, why that might be happening. Similarly, P to S ratios appear to discriminate down to very small magnitudes but they also have issues for um, deeply buried or, or small events, overburied or, uh, or, or small events. Um, on the left-hand side is kind of the classical side where we see that you know, the P waves are stronger in, in explosions and LG is stronger in, in earthquakes. Um, and in North Korea, they actually did separate pretty well, as you can see in the center figure there. Um, but in, in figure right to the, to the right of that, for a deeply overburied shot called Helum, um, that was two kilometers deep, uh, peaceful nuclear explosion in the former Soviet Union, um, it plots firmly in the, in the earthquake range as opposed to the explosion range. So what is causing that? And that's a harder thing to get at because we don't have a lot of data in those regions. These things weren't commonly overburied. And so if you look at the upper right figure, we have this region in green here. That's kind of the, real, the realm now that we're interested in. And there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of data in that realm for the small and or overburied, overburied data. So to get at some of these, some of these uh, questions, we, in 2010, initiated a three-phase project called the Source Physics Experiment. And it's a series of chemical explosions at the Nevada National Security Site to 
um, develop the proper necessary data to inform phys new physics-based models. Um, and so the, the, the broad outline is that we use chemical explosions as surrogates for nuclear explosions. We used multiple explosions to sample, you know, varying the yield and varying the depth of burial and varying the geology to get to kind of isolate each individual um, parameter that we're interested in. And key, the key port was we were able to use the same hole for each geology so that we could eliminate source effects, I mean, path effects and propagation effects from, from the data so that we can get to the source effects. So NNSS is a great natural laboratory because we have both explosions historically from testing, but we also have earthquakes as well and a, a robust natural seismicity. So it's an excellent place to do work. On the right-hand side, there we have the phase one was in granite. We had six shots at varying depths and, and yields. And then uh, at the bottom right, it's, uh, we moved to what's called DAG, dry alluvium geology. And, and phase one was in a wet granite. So we had these brackets, this, you know, two very dissimilar geologies. And for SPI phase three, which is what is called the Rock Valley Direct Comparison Test, we're actually moving to a third geology, which would be um, uh, Paleozoic limestone or Paleozoic uh, sedimentary rocks. And so this, this is made possible because in 1993, there was a series of, sh of unusually shallow earthquakes on the test site, on the Nevada National Security site. Uh, most earthquakes in Nevada happen at the brittle ductal transition, you know, nine kilometers to 11 kilometers depth. But for some reason, uh, in 1993, in the southern part of the, of the security site, there was a series of uh, at least 12 greater than magnitude two earthquakes that uh, initially seemed to be at, at depths of two kilometers or less. And that really raises the possibility now that we can actually drill down to that source region and do a, an explosion in that exact hypercentral region. Um, and that would get at getting rid of a couple more parameters that we talked about, the source region material properties, as well as the depth of burial. You can see in the, in the, in the center figure there that we're getting rid of depth and source media properties as, as confounding factors, and we're left just with mechanism and source spectra. Like I said, these events were a magnitude two or greater, and we're gonna try to make an explosion as of a, of a reasonably similar uh, seismic yield um, so that we could propagate out to regional distances and compare directly on the same instruments that recorded those shots. So our first step was to make sure that we actually do have shallow earthquakes and that we could locate them effectively. So we used modern tools, uh, the three national labs and the Nevada National Security Site, all the, all the co-authors had experts in their, in their region, um, you know, agree upon a, a common set of picks for the earthquakes, looked at all the available data, they all used the tools that are in common use at their own institution and came up with agreed upon, um, agreed upon locations for all these, for all these uh, epicenters and, and depth as well. And a number of different techniques were used. This, will, this is a subject of a paper that's being submitted uh, maybe even this week to uh, BSSA, I believe. And so uh, on the left-hand side there, we have the epicenter estimates. And you can see we have very tight clusters. The, 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 the bar, the mileage bar on the, the, the top, the distance bar on the top is only 0.5 kilometers. So we have very tight clusters of epicenter, um, as well as depth estimates from multiple techniques. I've shown here the tau p inversions and also using waveform modeling. And indeed, these two and these earthquakes are indeed generally less than two kilometers depth and, and a pretty, a pretty tight distribution. So what we want to do, I, this is, um, I'm gonna skip over because we started a little bit late. This is uh, part of my poster that I have tomorrow. This is the downhole instrumentation that we're going to have for these, uh, for these explosions. So the, in brief, these holes are going down to two kilometers deep. Well, that's where we're gonna set off the explosions. And we also have three holes that'll also go down that far in which we'll have distributed acoustic sensing, distributed thermal sensing, and geophones to record these. Similarly, we're gonna have a very robust surface network of, of seismoacoustic sensors as well as um, other instruments like GPS and things like that. And again, I'll talk about, I can talk about this, come to my poster tomorrow and we, we can talk about where we have, but briefly, we're just going to prioritize recording and reoccupying stations that actually recorded the 1993 events as well as uh, the events that we're going to set off. And our shot matrix is, is placed in the, on the bottom right there, so we're gonna have three explosions. One's called the integrated system test which is a surface explosion, 
It is mostly done to exercise our ability to make sure our timing and firing is correct. Uh, we're not used to setting off um, chemical explosions with you know two kilometers of you know two kilometers distant from the actual from the actual uh, firing system. So we're going to make sure that works. Our, se our first test is called RVDC1. It'll be about one tenth the size of RVCD2, and that's more of a green function shot for propagation. Um, situations where we are considerations and also to exercise the system again downhole and then RVDC2 which will be a 10 ton yield shot and which will approximate the, the, the size of the some of the smaller aftershocks that were recorded regionally. While we're trying to you know um, while we're drilling these holes and reacquainting ourselves with drilling big holes at a test site we're going we're continuing to work um, so we have built a, a, and we continue to find what we call the geologic framework model, GFM, that incorporates input from over 900 drill holes uh, on, the, on the national security site and decades of geologic mapping. We're very lucky to be in an area that is, we have robust geologic control that uh, we're able to use um, boreholes, like I said. There's also high resolution seismic reflection, refraction and reflection surveys, gravity surveys, SAR, all sorts of material that's being input in this gigantic uh, geologic framework model. And we use this model um, to inform modeling. And so example here, um, we do, we have some modeling that shows that, um, you know, we can, we can put virtual earthquakes and virtual explosions anywhere in this geologic framework model, add stochastic variability, and then a try our discriminants and see how they work. This is a very interesting example that shows that for PDS, um, if we have a, the, the black star is the source region, and um, we have three recording stations that are shown in white triangles. And depending on what station you're, you're looking at, the explosions can look like an earthquake, the explosions can look like an explosion, the uh, earthquakes can look like an earthquake, or the earthquake can look like an explosion. And then we have all three of those end models um, shown in the, in the bottom pane there where if you're, looking, if you're in station A1, that looks typical. If you're looking at A2, the earthquake looks like an explosion. And if you're at station A3, the explosion looks like an earthquake. So what, what is the cause of this? Is it purely a propagation path? Or is, there, is, there, um, is it caused by depth, source material properties? So these are the kind of questions we want to answer with this experiment. So in summary, um, we have an exciting fundamental science problem that we're trying to solve here. And it is all made possible by the fact that there's a very shallow series of earthquakes in 1993 on the Nevada National Security Site. Um, we have a rare chance to measure active fault properties, so when we drill down, we're gonna be taking core measurements. We're gonna take, we're gonna take core out of the holes. We're going to do material properties on these, on, these, uh, on, these, uh, on the rocks that come up, and we're gonna have, hopefully, an answer as to why there are these shallow earthquakes there. Um, we're gonna use lessons learned about from previous fee test, SPI test beds um, so we've really improved, I think, our modeling capability based on the two previous uh, portions of SPI, and we're going to be using those um, lessons learned, and we're going to learn new lessons on how to do, again, deep, drill deep, large diameter boreholes. And as I said, we're going to continue to work while we're, while we're waiting for the holes to be drilled. We've got, um, so far, over 70 peer-reviewed publications um, have been come out of the SPI uh, program, and uh, we'll continue to advance our, our, our modeling capabilities. Uh, so tomorrow, I have e poster 21, which I talk about the recording array and the downhole uh, and DAS and things like that. So please come, please come to that. And I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. Good timing. We will entertain one or two questions. Any question or comment? Yes, please. As to when the when the events will, as when the events will happen, okay. that's you know perhaps appropriate. Um, if I if I made an exact prediction of when the shots will go up, I'd be wrong. But I think the we know the order is going to be IST, then then one and two, IST maybe in, in a couple of year time frame, and then the, the the additional shots after that. Sorry. Any other question or comment? Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Rizadin. Uh, please do a bit of introduction also, please. So I can't see that one. 
I don't see anything, okay. so I can't see this one, I can't see that one. I'm too short or too tall. All right. You just use oh, the right. Thank you. Next. That one is next in the All right, thank you. The, the, the previous one. Uh, so my name is Suhail Azadim. I am a mathematician physicist, but I do a lot of ground shock. Um, I work at Lawrence Livermore Lab. My co-author is Oleg Vorobiev. He has a similar background than me. And um, Bill Walter, Antun Tarapai, and Jeff Wagner, who is our main geologist at Lawrence Livermore Lab. So my talk is going to be um, threefold. Um, the first two parts is mainly about SP phase one and phase two. And then, uh, so this, so yeah, so that's my talk. So I'm gonna talk about the modeling simulation framework. Actually, it's, it was really pioneer work. It's still considered as, as a good thing that we've done for SP phase one and two. We're adopting it to phase three. I'm gonna show some simulations and results of phase one and two and some lessons learned. I don't, I'm gonna run through the lessons learned as I show the slides. And then the last part is mainly phase three Rock Valley direct comparison, which Rob Abbott just introduced. Um, so the motivation, uh, I'm gonna skip it because Rob Abbott has really done a good job. Um, but um, here's what we are looking at actually, is we are trying to simulate the near feed and the far feed, the processes. And we are trying to couple them, actually. We are going to use hydrodynamic codes for the nonlinear regime, and then wave propagation, elastic wave propagation code for the far feed regime. And the goal is really to, um, um, uh, how do you say, uh, quantify the energy partition between the different processes. For example, in the far field observation is the integration of the source effects, the free surface effect, and the path effect. And the goal is to assess those partitions of the energy and see whether they are persistent by switching the fabric of the geology, say alluvium to granite. So we decided to run the SP phase one in granite and then the SP phase two called DAG in the alluvium geology. And so because I'm from Lawrence Livermore Lab, I'm gonna bank on the HPC capabilities in order to assess the uncertainty in the characterization of the geology on the response of the system. So this is a summary slide. I think Rob Abbott did a good job. So on the top right-hand side, you see six shots for the SP phase one. They're in granite. It took us about six years to get them done. It's because the geology is hard and we have a more elaborate um, instrumentation system. Uh, for phase two is a softer rock. It's called the dry alluvium geology. And it took us only two days to do four shots. For the RVDC, which is on the right hand side, left hand side, so we're gonna drill, as Rob had showed, two boreholes, observation boreholes. They are about two kilometer deep. The, observ the, the working point borehole is gonna be about two kilometers deep and about 40 inches to 48 inches diameter. Um, uh, next to each of these shots um, or campaign, there are several um, nuclear shots that we can compare to. So the first two um, phases were mainly to um, decipher or understand actually the genesis of the shear motion that it's using in the PS ratio and discriminate between nuclear shot and explosive shots, while the phase three is more oriented to comparing explosions to earthquakes. So talking about uncertainty for phase one, it's mainly granite with uh, some fractures. So the fractures are defined as discontinuities they're also represented by their size, their density, orientation, and their space of variability within the rock. For phase two, we have the alluvium, which is characterized by different lenses with different contrast to porosity. So as you see later, actually, for phase one, the genesis of the shear motion is mainly the joints, and for the alluvium shots, where the genesis of the shear motion is mainly the contrast of porosity between the lenses. Uh, phase three, it's... Uh, more challenging because it combines both of them. So the first kilometer is mainly sedimentary rock, and it has a water table about 500 meters deep from the ground surface, while the bottom rock, which is one kilometer deep, the first top 200 meters, which is dolomite, highly fractured, and the bottom uh, PZ rock is mainly pristine rock with some faults. 
as you will see later. So the framework is really we split uh, the pieces of the problem and sub-problems. That's my philosophy of doing these um, uh, highly nonlinear problem. The first box is pretty much the nonlinear field. The second box is the far field. Uh, Arvind Pitaka will address those, I think, tomorrow or the day after. And then the other one is mainly for yield estimation and how to optimize actually your network in order to monitor better or invert for the source. Um, the first two pieces, or the first piece mainly, will create the source for the seismic as the, the acoustic um, um, simulations. So to give a credit to a lot of people that they contribute to this framework, I just took the same boxes and split some of the data that's needed for each of the steps. And I tried to give some credit to different people from different labs. This is an integrated effort throughout the DOE complexes. So here's how it works, actually. So our unique HPC-driven end-to-end source to receiver coupled wave propagation capability is being adapted, as I said, to RVDC. The way we do it, as I said, so we generate like stochastic realization, whether off the subsurface um, alluvium or the fracture network. We uh, solve the nonlinear wave propagation using geodine, which is the middle box. We create a source abstracted box, and we will hand it to the far field people. And we repeat that as many times as we have to in order to assess the uncertainty in the characterization itself on the response of the system. So for SPE phase one and two, I collected almost three quarters of petabytes of results. And those results are going toward um, machine learning as well as model reduction. So um, we are working on that. Uh, three quarter of petabyte is a lot of uh, data, and we use about 10 to 15 percent of cluster just to run these simulations. Um, but to do the nonlinear field uh, simulations, you have to get the right um, equations of state. So for the explosive, we use usually what we call JWL, and for the rock properties, actually, we use what we've learned from the nuclear shots and the Nevada test site. So on the right-hand side is the attenuation curve. We usually try to represent the peak velocity, peak acceleration, and peak displacement as a function of the range from the working point. And for the granite, you have a single, a single linear mode. So it's like that gray straight line. And as you see, those gray dots are the nuclear shot. The Red squared, which are labeled granite slash geodyne, are what we could reproduce actually using our equation of state. And we do very well. Um, for the nonlinear uh, regime for the alluvium, which is uh, characterized by two uh, straight lines, um, and the onset of the linear regime, actually, it's very hard to do. And yet, as you could see, we really were successful to reproduce this stuff. We're doing the same thing, as I said, for the RVDC because it's the combination of both material, the soft and the hard, plus you have what they call the water table, and the water table we usually create what we call Fox and event and, and shock physics, so it's going to be more challenging. Here's how is the layout of the instrumentation of FOIS1. Again, like Rob Muller stressed, all this data is available to the public. I'm not a specialist on how to retrieve it. You can ask some people in the room that they know how to do it. Um, so again, you can see all the accelerometer. Each one costs about fifteen to $25,000. We got a lot of elaborate system. Uh, for SP phase one, we had a lot less time to do the characterization. Uh, so when we run, actually, um, I started SP phase uh, SP-3. So it's the third shot in the source physics experiment phase one. Um, I created the whole model and framework on the SP3, and then I applied it to do applied prediction for SP4, 4 prime, 5, and 6, and the subsequent shot DAG 1 through 4. And as you could see through the left-hand side, for example, I have a 3 by 3 pictures. Each column is either the radial component, the tangential component, and the vertical component, and each row is a specific one of those accelerometers that I showed you in the previous shot. Uh, what you see in each of these curves are the purple one, the bold one, is the observed one. The red thick uh, line is the predicted one. 
the red dashed lines are the 95 percentile confidence from the Monte Carlo simulations. And the DFN 0 through 3 are three realizations, to just to give you a flavor of the variation between the simulations. So as you could see, these were blind shots. So I usually give all the prediction of uh, pre-shot uh, shots. And then once we get the results or the observation, we just plot them against. And we did really very well, as you could see, similar in SP5. SP6 is more challenging one because it's very shallow and the scaling uh, laws are really made for deep um, shots. So this is a more challenging one than the, all the first five ones. Yet the SP6 um, responded quite well actually as if it was uh, similar to the other one. And that's because uh, the granite is a strong layer up to about 17 meters or so. So it responded as it expected, and it did not defy in some ways the, the rule of the scale and loss. Moreover, we learned that SP, all the SP phases, 10 to 20% um, of uh, the, sh the radial component is converted into shear motion. So that helped us actually to understand the physics and how the shear motions are produced. Moreover, we looked and we saw some of the tangential components are very similar to the radial one. We thought that we were wrong, but actually we looked at similar shot not too far from the site of SPE phase one, which is hard uh, hat and hard. So we found out actually in the nuclear shot, we saw similar behavior and we have a good uh, explanation for what, what may have caused that. Um, uh, SPAL. SPAL is the worst one that you can predict, actually, because it integrates the whole physics along the column from the work plant, uh, point all the way to the surface. And there is the surface interaction with the material. Uh, but yet, if you look at the results, uh, where is the pointer, actually, this top one? I think there's no pointer. Uh, oh, there's no pointer, so that's fine. So there is a, a, a four, four accelerometers, surface accelerometer. So the O in green is the observed curve. Uh, the O in red is pretty much the average one, and the U and A is the upper and the lower uh, confidence interval, and the A is the average curve. So you can see that the green observed curve, it's within the range of what we expected as variation in our stochastic realization. The black one is pretty much one over G. It's really small under gravity. And it shows that everything, again, it works very well because granite is a very hard rock. We also predicted very well the displacement at a couple points, actually. So the red numbers are what has been observed, and the black numbers with their standard deviation is what have been predicted. Uh, alluvium, we thought, is going to be a lot easier, but actually it was much more challenging because at different scales it reflects different spatial variability, not to mention the non-stationarity. So because we had limited time, we went with a tripod, as it shows in the middle pictures there, and three rings of deployment of the accelerometer, as you see in the cross-section, the vertical on the left-hand side. We also did two or three uh, 45 degrees to see how much energy would be, part how do you say, um, uh, moved toward the downward from uh, shot number three, and we did similar one for shot one. There is a one deeper one accelerometer to understand how much of the energy will go into the deeper layers. We selected uh, a continuous, not a binary representation of the high and low contracts and porosity. And so to do that, we looked at the characterization through the 12 boreholes. And we found out, as I said, there is no stationarity and anisotropy. Uh, it's prominent in all the directions. So we had actually to write or rewrite codes to add the non-stationarity because most of the academician, they like stationarity, it's easy to program. And that allowed us to use a joint probability distribution to several of the variables that we measured and helped us to constrain more than Monte Carlo simulations that we need to run. These are very expensive runs, so. Uh, here's an example of how SPEO, DAC3 shots in 3D, you see on the left-hand side the absolute value, how it changes as function of time. And you can see actually the variation of the geology, how it created actually non-spherical shock. Therefore, it is, um, there is a genesis of shear motion. And again, like I said, um, a contrast of 2% between the lenses 
will create at least 5 to 10% uh, shear motions uh, conversion from the radial component. Again, we saw several um, motion recorded above dog one of the shot number uh, um, uh, two and three, actually. And we showed actually there is a variation in the northeast and the southwest. Remember, we have a tripod uh, instrumentation system. And we saw actually there is always a delay in the arrival of the shear motion. And that can be explained because there is more continuity in the horizontal direction of the lenses, and there is more lenses that you sample in the vertical direction. Therefore, you expect there is more delay in the vertical direction than the horizontal one. Um, what we've seen also is the Barrett and Bass, which is the conventional wisdom used in all of the design of these shots, it does not really hold. And the alluvium that we dealt with in area two was a lot stronger than the average alluvium in the Nevada test site. Again, going back to using um, the uh, surface displacement or the peak displacement at the surface. Again, what you see here are different columns. The left one is mainly the output of the model, so it gives you the surface displacement, uh, peak displacement, as well as uh, uh, peak acceleration and peak velocities. You can see that they're not spherical because it's not a homogeneous system, while the second column is mainly the Barrett and Bass, and you can see there is a strong difference between the two. So we're moving away from the Barrett and Bass, and we treat every site specific given the uncertainty associated with. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you how the observed peak ground accelerations uh, looked like versus the blind um, predictions, and we do really very well. Remember, the observations were only measured along the tripod, and it was interpolated all over the places. Our numerical simulation, of course, is more continuous but they are in a strong agreement. We also developed a nice prediction for the spas. Again, like I told you, it's the hardest one to predict. Not only we can predict them numerically, but we developed a numerical analytical solutions, actually not numerical, uh, reduced order model that actually can be used on the fly without having to go through all the, uh, the simulation that I showed you. And we predicted actually most of the SPE right on, as well as the DAC charts. The Rock Valley, so this is a picture that um, Rob Abbott had presented, uh, so I'm gonna move. It's highly fractured media. My near field used to be about 1.5 kilometers, now it's about five kilometers to integrate as much uncertainty and heterogeneity in the system. Um, we have selected actually through the our legacy data in the 1996, there are some underground nuclear explosions. We're using those as analogs. Um, they are listed there. One is a Los Alamos, one is a Livermore, and one is a combination between the two geologies that we are interested in. One is a dry, one is wet, and one is partially saturated. So it gives us actually a good calibration set. We have also cores that they are stored there for the last 60 years or so. 70 years now, and so we have everything that we can start with. Uh, we designed the source. Summarize. Say it again. Summarize. Yeah. So anyway, there's a lot of work that has been done. So we don't just shoot shots. There's a lot of work that needs to be done before really we decide on the location, uh, the final design, and then we shoot the shots. We check how well we did, and then we. Uh, we present our findings and we share the data. So the rest is really numerical simulation of different conditions for the SPE phase three and putting them there for all the audience and so you can see them when you have time. So that's pretty much. We looked also on the, how the ejecta actually can uh, move far away for the surface shots. So we need to create an exclusion zone so the ejecta will determine where the exclusion zone is. With that, I will take any questions. I have two slides, two posters too, so feel free to stop by and ask any questions if you wish. Thank you very much. Uh, we will entertain one question. Sorry, we are a bit late, so any question here? A non-linear one, please. <laughs> <laughs> question? All right, it was all yeah. clear. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right.
Yeah, the next speaker. Uh, oh yeah. Very good. So, Mr. Alviziri, okay, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Celso. I'm a seismologist at the Norwegian Seismic Array. Uh, this work, oh, can I see the screen? So? Yeah, yeah, it, it's down there. Okay. Uh, it's a bit inconvenient. Oh, I, oh, I can see it. Okay. This screen is a bit, you know, it's obscuring. need to point. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit closer to this. Okay. Yeah. Hi, yes, so I'm a seismologist at the Norwegian Seismic Array. Uh, the work that I'll be presenting deals with uh, resolving seismic moment tensors. Well, yeah, as the title suggests. Uh, I'll be presenting about resolving seismic moment tensors and this deals with characterizing seismic sources um, at regional and teleseismic distances. So the focus of my work is three events in Sweden, Eastern United States, and Northwest Russia. This is work in collaboration with my colleagues, Tormod Caverna uh, and Benjamin Dando. Uh, next is, uh, sorry, this is next, I guess. Sorry. Yes, okay. And this one is the previous one. Okay. No yes, a uh, brief outline of my work. Uh, I'll, again, I'll be discussing three events in Sweden, USA, Russia. I'll be discussing about the IDC, the International Data Center um, event screening, uh, discuss briefly about moment tensor analysis, and discuss screening with moment tensors and conclusions. So the three events that I will be focusing on are, oh, oops. Well, okay, I guess the pointer doesn't work. The three circles that you can see are in, um, Yes, Eastern United States, uh, and the green triangles are the stations, the open stations that are available at the time of these events. Uh, the two other events, they, um, they are close to each other somewhat. One is in northern Sweden, the third one is in uh, northwest Russia in the Kola Peninsula. Um, and, the bl and the blue triangles are um, IMS stations. Right, and the motivation of this work is we would like to routinely and robustly differentiate among explosions, earthquakes, collapses, and many other types, any other type of uh, mechanisms. So I think you might be familiar with this figure, um, but it shows uh, uh, the range of many, many possible seismic sources on Earth. So that can be volcanic events, earthquakes, machinery, nuclear blasts, which is the topic, of course, of this whole meeting, uh, mine collapses, and on the surface, you can have anything from mine blasts, uh, accidents, and terrorism, and so on. And, the, uh, and many of these events, not all, but many of them can be analyzed in terms of the so-called moment tensors. Uh, and the moment tensors, in turn, they can be organized on the so-called Lund diagram, and that's this funny-looking diagram to the right of the screen. Uh, and to the top of the diagram are um, usually explosion type of mechanisms. Towards the center are these uh, well, earthquake types of mechanisms, and towards the bottom uh, are the collapse mechanisms. So, and these are the events that I will be looking at. Right, so the three events are the one in Kiruna, Sweden in 2020. Uh, it occurred at an active um, iron mine in the Kiru Navarra region. The IDC reported a magnitude of 4.7 for this event and a magnitude of uh, surface wave magnitude of 3.9. This event was also widely monitored and widely observed um, in nearby uh, geophones. Um, these are not unfortunately openly available in total 253 uh, geophones. So this is uh, one of the best instrumented mines in the world. Unfortunately, not all the data is available. But one of the reports that came out of this uh, event is that they detected over 80,000 aftershocks between magnitudes minus three and two. And as you can see in the figures, these are some evidence of what happened um, after the collapse. So this is, these are some pictures taken from inside the mine. So yes, presumably, as, well, as you can see, these are collapse type of events. The next event in Tennessee, this occurred in 2021, uh, Crab Orchard Mine. Uh, the IDC reported a magnitude of body wave magnitude of four. They were not able to obtain a surface wave magnitude. 
And again, there's evidence that shows uh, well that this was some sort of collapse, as you can see from the picture at the center bottom, that it shows a depression. Uh, uh, f this is an aerial view. And uh, on the top two figures, it shows, well, it's a little bit hard to see, I think, but it shows uh, uh, pictures from, from a video that recorded uh, a few minutes, a few seconds before, and a few seconds after the event. So a, fifth, a few seconds after the event. And this is uh, looking towards the, the mouth of the mine. So after a few seconds, well, you see this release of, of powders and, and, and air. And the third event is in uh, Norpak, Kola Peninsula. This, is, uh, this, uh, this event occurred at, an, at a known uh, um, mining location, mining district. In, uh, it's an apatit mine. It's an open pit. The IDC reported a body weight magnitude of 4 and a surface weight magnitude 3.6. And it's worth noting that this event also occurred near a previous nuclear test site. Um, yeah, and the takeaway out of, this, uh, out of this slide is that these are all, um, well, these are all, as expected, uh, mining events. Not of, not, none of them released anomalous uh, xenon gas, so these are probably mining the events. But yet, uh, there are some inconsistency with how these events were screened at the IDC. Uh, the IDC uses the so-called scre event screening criteria. And yes, and so for the Kiruna event, they reported uh, a score of minus negative 2.03, so you cannot be screened out as a non, uh, as a, as an explosive event. On the other hand, the Tennessee event, it was um, screened out. Well, they were not able to, to produce a, um, a proper screening because they have insufficient data. Because to compute this event, they needed uh, surface waste magnitudes, but they, did not, they were not able to compute this. And for the third event, well, this event was properly screened out, yes. So what is going on? And so I analyzed these events in terms of moment tensors, uh, as I described earlier, and I use a methodology that allows me to explore the full space of moment tensors. Um, and it's basically the, the way method the methodology works is by proposing a moment tensor in, in, in any given location in moment tensor space. It computes synthetic seismograms. It compares the synthetic seismograms with the observations, and it um, and, and it and it does this for for a range of uh, focal mechanisms um, in in moment tensor space, and that allows me to populate a figure like you see on the right, the Lund figure. Um, this is a summary figure uh, out of 40 million solutions, um, and out of this I can compute probabilities for source types, um, sample moment tensor space, source types and uncertainties, and produce source time source models. I won't be able to go into the details, but if you have any questions, please check out this publication, or you can ask me. So uh, yes, uh, one application of this uh, methodology is to the six no, um, North Korean nuclear tests. Uh, the figure, yes, uh, the figure on the top left, yes, it shows the location of the events, um, and the figure on the center it shows again the Lund diagram. Uh, this is the Lund diagram and, and, and the uncertainty and, and analysis for the for the six North Korean nuclear tests. And if I can just draw your attention, I don't know if you can see it. There's a green circle on top of the Lund. Um, well, I don't think I can point with this. No pointer. No pointer. Okay. Um, but anyway, there's a green circle on, on the top of the loon. So yes, as expected, this is a, a, an explosive type of event. And then um, a few minutes after this uh, this last nuclear test, there was another anom uh, another mechanism, and this turned out to be a collapse type of mechanism, which is um, yes, as you can see on the top right figure uh, on the loon. Um, yeah, the best solution happens to fall at the bottom, and as I showed earlier, explosives are on the top of the loon, um, earthquakes towards the center, and collapses towards the cent to towards the bottom. Uh, right, and to test the capability of the of the methodology, I also analyzed two other um, non non um, two other events that are not related to the nuclear test, two regular tectonic earthquakes, and yes, as expected, well, yes, we are able to um, we were able to estimate. Um, the mechanisms for these uh, tectonic events as regular double couple type of events. So for the Kirun event, I used um, right. So this figure shows the the best fitting solution using only IMS stations. Uh, for this uh, for this solution, I used stations from the Arkes, NOAA, Finnes, and HFS. I used a total of 27 stations, um, and these stations fall within um, a radius between 298 to 910 kilometers from the epicenter. The, uh, 
Right. Uh, and then I also analyze this event in terms of every possible uh, um, station available from, from the epicenter. So that's using IMS and open stations. Right, and the moment tensor analysis for uh, using IMS only stations, it shows uh, well, uh, it shows a decent fit between the observed and the synthetic waveforms. So, the figure on the left shows um, um, the first column. If you can see the, the wiggles, show the stations, the, the the seismograms recorded at the stations, and the reds are the synthetic, and the black is the observed. So, as you can see, there's a, a match between the observed and the synthetic. The first column is uh, vertical. Rayleigh waves. The second column is uh, 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 radial Rayleigh waves, and the third column is transverse. And the best fitting solution happens to fall um, towards the towards the bottom of the loon. Uh, but as you can see by the uh, oh, the, the coloring scheme, shows uh, the range of uncertainty. And so it shows in blue means that many solutions within this uh, within this region showed similar waveform fits. They produce similar waveform fits. On the other hand, if I use IMS uh, with open stations, the, yeah, this is the result. So here I am only showing a snippet of the results. I'm here, I'm showing uh, stations between 80 to 100 to 275 kilometers. But in total, for this event, I used 116 stations up to uh, um, 1,500 kilometers. And the best fitting solution is in this so called negative isotropic or collapse region of the loon. So using a similar approach, again, I analyzed the Tennessee event. Um, the wiggles on the left, again, show, uh, uh, yeah, on the left panel, they show the red are the synthetic, the black is the observed. So there's a, a good match between the observed and the synthetic. And the best fitting solution, again, shows, um, yes, at the bottom of the loon. So that's the negative isotropic domain that's, a, yes, collapse as expected. Same for the Northwest Russia event. This was a smaller event, so you can see that um, the, the observed waveforms, they, they were noisy. But again, the, the best fitting solution is towards the bottom of the loon. Um, right, so to summarize, uh, using seismic full moment tensors, uh, I was able to obtain consistent negative isotropic or collapse types of mechanisms for three events in. Kiruna, Tennessee, and Northwest Russia. And as you can see, uh, the best fitting solution, that's uh, if you uh, pointed by the black arrows, they're all consistently in the negative isotropic domain. Right, so uh, moment also suggest an, uh, um, another approach for screening, um, for differentiating between different types of mechanisms. Uh, so yes, we can use source screening with moment also. So again, uh, explosions on the top in this figure I show um, uh, results from previous studies that showed the nuclear uh, explosions at the nuclear at the Nevada test site and the North Korea. That's the yellow circles on the top of the loon. I show the earthquakes. The earthquakes happen to hover towards the center of the loon and the collapses. So here I'm showing, um, yeah, a, a sequence. Um, yes, I'm showing the Sweden event, the Russia, the USA event, and also a sequence of uh, events that occurred in, in Hawaii, in Kilauea. This is during. Um, um, a volcanic event in Kilauea. Um, and for details, please check out the, the, the paper at the bottom. This was published in the PSL. But essentially, it follows a progression of 54 magnitude 5 collapses, collapse events in Kilauea. So in conclusion, I um, showed, I discussed about uh, three mining events in Sweden, US, and Russia, and inconsistent event screening at the IDC. In particular, the Kirun event was uh, screened as possible explosive, which uh, evidence show, of course, that it's not. Um, I estimated the moment tensions with waveforms using IMS and open stations, which show consistent collapse mechanisms. And so this also suggests a need to supplement IMS with open stations for event screening. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the second part of uh, the session on seismoacoustic sources and theory and practice. There will be two presentations now on infrasound, and the first one will be given by our Korean colleague about infrasound bulletin in Korea. You have the floor, Ms. Park.
Good afternoon. I'm Jung Hyun Park, a research staff at Southern Methodist University in the United States. Um, this work is um, a work um, done with my colleague um, Stephen, Chris, and Brian, and collaboration with Lee Young at Korea Institute of Geoscience and Mineral Resources in South Korea. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank to um, CTVTO for uh, Trevor's support for this presentation. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, Korea Infrasound Bulletin that we documented over the last um, 24 years. Um, our interest is regional scale um, 100 kilometer network for this study. Uh, since 1999, um, SMU and KIGAM have um, been cooperatively operating um, six seismoacoustic arrays in South Korea. Um, each array um, has a different number of uh, array elements, um, uh, uh, from four to 13 elements, um, with a different configuration and different scale, as shown here. Um, and also, we added uh, two IMS infrasound stations in Russia and uh, Japan for our automatic processing. Um, using this multiple array data, we are focusing on infrasound detections and locations uh, for producing um, automatic bulletins um, for infrasound sources. And using these uh, bulletins, we can quantify the detection um, source distribution in time and space. And also we can um, document what is the atmospheric nature as well as repeated source. So uh, some of our interesting, uh, some par particular event can be reviewed in radar for our interest. So we are gonna take a look at some interesting um, event radar. So uh, we are, we are able to show some infrasound event bulletin for 1999 to 2022 um, here. For automatic infrasound detection procedure, uh, we use the uh, adaptive app detector developed by Aerosmith et al. Waveform first uh, filter one to five hertz and time window of 20 seconds with 50% uh, overlapping. So you can see here infrasound detection uh, density for over the uh, last 24 years. And y-axis shows the each different array we have, and small y-axis shows the back azimuth of detections. So as you notice here, CHNR, the very first um, um, uh, the top uh, panel has long history of detection uh, result. So that was our first, first installation, to, uh, 1999. Um, we are actually, we investigated really uh, interesting signal from mining explosions. So that was really motivation to add more arrays in time. So there was um, KSJR, BRDR, and KMPR um, installation in the Korean Peninsula. And there was early stage of our installation, and later, uh, 2011, we added more testing array, TJIAR and YPDAR, and also we added two um, additional IMS infrasound array um, uh, station data. And uh, from the 2012, we um, have eight uh, regional infrasound array data for our automatic procedure. And the other inter interesting point is here that we have some seasonal variation of uh, detection back azimuth. So um, if we take a look at very small uh, box, it, which is a black box here in the next slide, uh, this shows the infrasound detection density um, for uh, at CHNR for one year. So as you can see that during the winter time and uh, spring time, we have a strong in infrasound detection from northwest, and this is changing direction during the summer times, so which is the dominant detection from the east. So this is typical stratospheric wind direction change in Korean Peninsula. So it uh, affects our detection result as well. Um, using infrasound detection result uh, that I showed in um, previous slide we can associate and locate the event. So we use the Bayesian infrasonic source location uh, developed by Modrock et al. Um, as an inversion technique. 
So we found a total of 36,815 in-person event location over the last 24 years. Um, and also we had um, very good ground truth information by North Korea. So um, we successfully document radius the five North Korea underground nuclear explosions. But um, the very first explosion in uh, 2006, we couldn't uh, document because of the smaller size of explosion itself. And the other good point is we can use this um, for forensic seismology and infrasound uh, study. Uh, recently, we had a really a big chemical expo explosion accident uh, in the Korean Peninsula, and we also successfully document this detection and location uh, from our automatic pr procedure. Um, this plot shows um, 2D histogram of infrasound event um, numbers uh, per area 0 0.2 by 0 0.2 degree. So we define a uh, strong red color or um, black color are the infrasound hotspots. So as you can notice here, many areas are corresponding our infrasound hotspot, but I'm really thankful that North Korea test site is not, not a hotspot. Um, but bad news is that I don't know what is the source, what is happening in the west coast of no North Korea and other areas, so uh, we need to investigate more about source characteristics. So that was our uh, motivation for this study. Oh, as we, we already seen some seasonal variation in detection of uh, infrasound signals, of course we can see some seasonal variation in the infrasound event. So during the summertime, we have a lot of infrasound event in the east coast of Korea or no, uh, south, south part of Russia or some uh, ocean area because of a stratosphere wind is dominant from east. But uh, opposite way, during the winter time, we have a lot of events um, from China and east coast of uh, North Korea and east coast of South Korea. So this is corresponding to the stratosphere wind direction. Uh, here is another interesting point that most events are corresponding to human activity. So same 2D histogram of infrasound event, but we divide it by weekday or weekend, daytime or nighttime. So very strong um, evidence that most infrasound event it happen weekday and also daytime. And you can see also histogram on the right uh, most event is happen from the mon Monday to Friday, and um, and uh, in the bottom right hi histogram shows the most events in the uh, morning time and decrease the number in the, in the lunch time and increase again after lunch time as we are here, <laughs> so very um, corresponding to the uh, human activity times. So from now, we will take a look at some interesting events. So we selected some of the very interesting events in the uh, infrasound hotspot. So on the right map, you can see the source location, the star, and left shows the record section of seismic and infrasound uh, waveforms. So uh, y-axis shows 40 minutes, and y-axis uh, y is array uh, information, and x-axis is 40 minutes. So uh, seismic arrivals are very strong, which is the blue um, arrival. So which is evidence of mining explosion in the North Korea. And our uh, collaborator, Lee Young, also documented this event is dominant from the mining explosion in North Korea uh, based on his uh, several publications. And following seismic arrival, we have uh, multiple um, infrasound signals and uh, what and the uh, sky blue is the automatic detection and red bar is associated signal for location. And also we use the seismic information and estimate the seismic origin time and um, we did some phase uh, identification of uh, infrasound signal whether this is stratospheric or trop tropospheric arrivals. So this is some Id identified um, arrival. Um, further, we compare our observation with prediction. So we use the infra GA and GOAC by Bloom and Waxler and um, for the simulation and use the um, G2S atmospheric specification um, uh, by drop. But um, this day maintenance by Dr. Roger Waxler's group at University of Mississippi. So we use that model for the simulation. So 
right map is very uh, busy, but color coded by um, different um, infrasound phase. So overall, this prediction is matched very well with uh, observation for this case. And here is another example near the Russia. So we don't know what is the source. If you have any information about this area, so, uh, please share with us the information. Um, anyway, the IS-45 um, recorded very clear tropospheric arrivals. And then all Korean arrays um, recorded multiple stratospheric arrivals um, due to multi-passing effect of propagation. So this is matched where um, for um, prediction as well. But only IS-30 Japan ar um, array doesn't have any detection, which is the corresponding, uh, is um, consistent with the prediction. Um, this is another example in the west coast of Korea. A very similar um, signal characteristic with previous, uh, pr previously shown in the Russian area. So we assume this can be underwater explosion uh, source. Um, and also, we have very strong uh, signal, but ray tracing doesn't predict any uh, phases associated with this event. So uh, it is very important because this event occurred during the September. So we um, had, we reviewed many events during the September. So G2S ray tracing doesn't support any observation during this time period because uh, this is a transition time from summer to winter time. So stratospheric uh, wind direction is very unstable at that time and very weak. So there's not many information uh, for the, from the G2S profile. And also we documented this is happened also for 2017 explosion in September. So personally, I don't like the September to predict uh, the observations uh, for during the, uh, this time period. So this is the last example in um, Korea, South Korea. Uh, uh, relatively, this is local uh, signal. So signal is propagated in the local distance and all the Korean arrays detected clear signal. You can see the two impulse arrivals, not uh, except for KSJR. So we will take a look at why uh, KSJR doesn't have a detection radar. So uh, as we did before, uh, I compared the observation with the ray tracing using G2S model here. So as you can see in the Korean Peninsula, we have several arrays, but uh, only one uh, array, which is a KSJR, no detection, and other has all the detection. But ray tracing uh, support only stratospheric or thermospheric uh, predictions, but which is not the region for the Korean arrays. So it's, it was fair. And then we found um, there, uh, there are wind profiler uh, data uh, supported by the Korean Meteorological Administration. And also we have Radio Zonde uh, from the University of Wyoming. So we use this um, local weather data for simulation and plotted here, which are the orange or yellow and sonified region. So this is co um, consistent with our observation but not perfect because of KSGR. KSGR doesn't have any um, 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 observation, but prediction it has uh, some result. So we were not satisfied with this result and then further explore um, with the topographic. Actually, the KSGR uh, is uh, surrounded by mountain. So, um, <laughs> so there may be some propagation barrier so you can see here the ensonified region. Um, we are running out of here. So ensonified region is uh, corresponding to our observation. So it was very promising to do that. So this is our summary. So uh, we documented 24 years the Korean in infrasound bulletin and seasonal vari variation in the infrasound detection and location, and mostly corresponding to the co human activities. And G2S is very um, support, but not for September or not for uh, local distance. So um, local weather data is very important and also topography is very important in the Korean Peninsula. So um, yeah, 
that's it. And uh, before the closing, I want to have some um, advertisement. I'm actually um, associate editor of a BSSA, and also Irvin is also BSSA editor. So first time ever, we have a BSSA booster in here, just around the coffee break over there. We have many goodies, so if you have any <laughs> So, um, so, um, any, um, if you have any question about BSSA, please stop by here and then we can ask some question. Yeah, we can have, yeah, answer. Uh, so unfortunately somebody told me this room has to be free at two. <laughs> so we have to go to the next uh, topic. But uh, thank you so much and uh, I guess uh, I guess everybody will be happy to see you there. Uh, so now is uh, the next speaker is here about uh, the use of uh, local infrasound uh, array during volcanic crisis. Uh, please introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hello. I'm uh, Maria. I work uh, in Ivar. And uh, this presentation. How can I work this? So here is type text and here is the previous. Okay. Yeah. Just this. This is a collaborative work between uh, uh, University of the Azores and uh, University of Florence, where we present two infrasound natural generated events. Uh, detected by uh, an in IMS infrasound station and an um, exper experimental temporary array. So, uh, in the Azores region, we have nine islands, space around uh, six, 600 kilometers, and we have two, two infrasound arrays in two islands, Graciosa and San Jorge. In Graciosa, we have the IS-42 station, and in San Jorge, we deployed last year an uh, experimental infrasound array in the context of a seismic volcanic crisis. And uh, in this sequence, we had an um, earthquake at the generate infrasound, a seismoacoustic event. Uh, the CVISA monitoring network deployed on the island has detected this very shallow earthquake of low magnitude and this event was detected by both of the arrays. Here are the results of the IS-42 stations, which is compatible with the results of uh, uh, SG-1 uh, array in San Jorge. We can see here, first we have the, um, the waveform of the seismic event. Um, two seconds after, the, the event was starting to get detected by, by SG-1 array. Um, the first, the, the first cluster is, is due to the shaking of the sensors. And then we have the, the flat area, the flat line is the infrasound signal. So to cross bearing, the, um, to determine the location of the event, we did a grid search analysis using the time arrivals at, at each, uh, each array and also the Bekazimuts, and considering a, a grid of one kilometer per node, uh, we did this, 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 this grid, and we, we were able, we, oh, okay, we consider direct wave propagation because it's only 40 kilometers distance between the, the two arrays. So we got the conclusion that the epicenter is estimated, uh, well, it gives an error about one kilometer, so it's very close to the epicenter of the seismic event. Also, we made a shake map, map considering the pressure distribution recorded at the arrays, not the epicenter. So, using the um, the, the the back azimuts from the um, the SG1 recorded, we uh, projected the distance, and we have too many, uh, two different areas. We have uh, pressure distribution around the epicentral area and also the blue dots are uh, above uh, scoria cones in this region. 
the next event was a ball light. Actually, first we detected an, an unknown signal, but with the geostationary lighting map uh, and also applying the ray tracing techniques, we could conclude it was a, a fireball that happened uh, north of San Miguel Island. Here we have the SU-1 observations. We have three main clusters. First, we have the stratospheric arrival. Second, the surface, sea surface reflection arrivals. And later, the thermospheric arrivals. This is consistent also with the IS-42 observations. Oh, by that time, the IS-42 was only operated by seven sen sensors. Now it's already operating with eight sensors. Uh, considering uh, NCAP uh, as a um, numerical weather model and also uh, uh, AVOG2 as a ground spatial model for um, uh, atmospheric specifications until thermosphere, uh, we do, did the ray tracing. Uh, in this plot we can see the, the stratospheric arrivals were of course the first ones to arrive at both stations. Then we have the sea surface reflections and later on, uh, the thermospheric rays. Here, there's a more interactive map where we can see uh, the, the applying the technique of the ray tracing and also the data uh, of the, the GLM at time that the flash was recorded. We could able to locate the fireball event around 40 kilometers altitude at north of San Miguel Island which is very consistent with the um, observable arrivals with the predicted ones, especially on the sea surface reflected waves, they are almost uh, the same. So what now? Uh, regarding the seismi seismoacoustic event, uh, we, we have to integrate the infrasound with uh, the seismic analysis because there are two different uh, networks. We don't have data integration yet. Uh, we can conclude only that this event has generated uh, infrasound from the shaking of, of the cones. There's evidence of the infrasound received by the array, but we cannot say that it really happened due to the shaking of this. So we have to also uh, uh, evaluate more uh, geological fault systems on the island to infer what really, what really created this, this infrasound. Um, there's a paper under development on this, this event. Regarding the ball light, as I already told you, uh, the ray tracing together with the GLM um, data allowed to locate the event at uh, around 40 kilometers altitude. Uh, this was um, an event that showed the, th the three uh, types of arrivals. Uh, also, um, we can see that we have a local source that was recorded by two, um, two stations, and we have a regional source. So uh, later on, we should estimate the detection capability of an IS-42 with a temporary array could be a great solution for this kind of regional monitoring. And thank you for your attention.